Hello, my name is Prince Cannon Carroll. I am a pediatric electrophysiologist at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, and I was asked to speak about polygenic contributions to monogenic disorders as part of the Pedirhythm Congress in 2022. When we think about monogenic versus polygenic diseases, we think of monogenic diseases as those caused by rare variants in a single gene. The diseases tend to be rare, and the genetic effect is relatively severe. These often have a traditional Mendelian inheritance like autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive, and we can think of some example diseases like sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis. In contrast, diseases that we think of as polygenic are influenced by common variants in many genes, often with relatively smaller genetic effects. These are also often influenced by environmental factors, and they tend to cluster in families but not have a strict Mendelian pattern of inheritance. And so some diseases that we think of as polygenic are coronary artery disease and type 2 diabetes. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that. There's really a spectrum of inheritance patterns. And so let's use this example of familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH. So there are some individuals with monogenic FH. And they have a single variant in a gene, LDLR, with a fairly strong effect. So the size of the circle represents the strength of the effect of the genetic variant on gene function. And in this example, that one single variant is enough to push a patient's LDL cholesterol from somewhere near the median to above the threshold for disease. At the other end of the spectrum is polygenic FH. So we have multiple variants in multiple genes, each of which individually has a relatively small effect, but when added up is enough to push a patient from a normal LDL cholesterol to above the threshold for disease. And then in the middle here, we have oligogenic FH. So oligo meaning few as opposed to one in monogenic or many in polygenic. Here we have a handful of variants in different genes, each of which has a fairly strong effect, not quite as strong as enough to cause monogenic FH. But in this example, this combination of two variants is enough to push a patient from a normal LDL cholesterol to above the threshold for disease. Now there's no discrete cutoff between oligogenic or polygenic. Um, we just think of a, a relatively small number here, uh, meaning few, and a relatively large number here. And so here's another illustration that's more focused on inheritable cardiac disorders, and this is from a circulation paper from uh, Marina Cerrone et al. And we tend to think of our diseases as monogenic, meaning one uh, variant with a strong genetic effect is enough to reach disease threshold. And then we have the oligogenic and polygenic examples here, where you have a few with relatively large effect sizes, as well as some with small effect sizes that, again, in combination reach disease threshold. Uh, I would say that many of our diseases are near monogenic. That is, there's uh, one variant with a fairly strong effect, not quite enough to get us to the disease threshold, but just add you know, one or two or maybe a few other small effect variants, or in some cases, environmental modifiers, and that's enough to get you to the disease threshold. So I'm gonna go through a few examples in the uh, channelopathy and cardiomyopathy world here. Uh, the first of which is uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So this is a paper from back in 2010 that looked at a relatively small number of patients with ARVC that met task force criteria. And in 38 subjects that had PKP2 variants, 16 of them, or nearly half, actually had a second hit in either a different related gene or sometimes uh, in the same gene, PKP2. So again, nearly half of their, uh, their cohort actually had two variants. So either compound heterozygosity, if it was two PKP2 variants, or digenic heterozygosity. And this would explain uh, the finding that we see in some families where you have affected individuals that actually had to have two mutations to manifest the disease. Here's an individual with one variant, no disease. Here's an individual with another variant, no disease. Uh, and so this explained some of the incomplete penetrance uh, that was observed in, in ARVC. And again, this is back in 2010. So we have an example of, of two genes here. Uh, now we get into uh, Brugada syndrome. And uh, Arthur Vilda gave us a nice talk on uh, the genetics of Brugada syndrome, so I'm not going to be uh, too detailed about this, but 
this was a very important paper from Connie Bazina uh, back in 2013. And this was a genome-wide association study of Brugada syndrome, uh, which uh, on its face seems a little counterintuitive um, since Brugada syndrome is you know, a rare disease, as we all know. And when we do a genome-wide association study, yes, we're looking at genetic variation across the genome, but these are all fairly common variants in the general population. So uh, most of these variants are much more common than Brugada syndrome itself, so we would not necessarily expect that they would contribute to Brugada syndrome. But in fact, they showed that three variants, one in SCN5A, one in SCN10A, and one in HE2 or near HE2, were all associated with Brugada syndrome at the uh, traditional genome-wide significance level. And so when you combine just those three common variants into this risk score here, so just simply count up the number of risk alleles you have. And again, since they're all fairly common, you can see that um, most people cluster here in the two or three or, or the one, two, three number of risk alleles. Um, you're much more likely to be a Brugada syndrome case as demonstrated here with the white columns than a control as demonstrated here with the black columns. And that's true in individuals of European descent as well as Japanese descent. And so here you see the odds ratio increasing with an increasing number of risk alleles. And so um, this suggests that common variants uh, are potentially causative in Brugada syndrome. Now this paper published in 2022 takes that same three gene polygenic risk score and applies it to a different population with Brugada syndrome. And I wanted to highlight a couple of features here. One is that the uh, polygenic risk score was actually most informative in the subset of patients with Brugada syndrome who were genotype positive with a loss of function mutation in SCN5A. And so that cohort is depicted here in panel C. So again, these are all patients who have a premature stop in SCN5A, some of them who have a Brugada syndrome diagnosis, that's those black columns here, and some of them who do not have a clinical diagnosis, that's the white columns here. And what you can see is those individuals in, in the white columns who don't have a clinical diagnosis of Brugada syndrome all have two or fewer risk alleles in addition to their SCN5A mutation. And those with three or more risk alleles all have Brugada syndrome. And so it appears that this polygenic risk score may actually uh, relate to some of the incomplete penetrance we see in SCN5A positive Brugada syndrome patients. And so this looks a lot like that near monogenic, or perhaps you call it oligogenic inheritance of Brugada syndrome. And now we move on to long QT syndrome. And so uh, in long QT syndrome, we have the benefit of polygenic risk scores for the QT interval that have been done in the general population. So we have a large number of risk alleles. So this polygenic risk score actually incorporates more than 60 common variants across the genome. And what you see here in this study by Najim LaRouchi and also uh, led by senior author Connie Bazina, uh, there's a normal bell-shaped curve of controls across the polygenic risk score for QT interval. But individuals who have long QT syndrome and are genotype positive, that is they have one of those rare uh, strong effect variants that underlie their long QT syndrome. You can see they're shifted a little bit to the right, but even more shifted is the population of patients who have a clinical diagnosis of long QT syndrome, but are genotype negative. And so uh, if you break the polygenic risk score into quartiles here, those in the third and fourth quartile have a much higher odds ratio compared to the first quartile for having a diagnosis of long QT syndrome. And you can just imagine if you just look at people here at the top of the bell-shaped curve, most of them are gonna have genotype negative long QT syndrome compared to genotype positive or uh, the control population. So they estimate that perhaps 15% of long QT syndrome individuals actually do not carry a single strong effect mutation, but rather have polygenic inheritance of their disease. And now this uh, last uh, example that I'm gonna show you here actually is not a channelopathy, but uh, refers to the cardiomyopathy. So uh, this was a really interesting paper that looked at uh, genome-wide association studies for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, and a number of LV traits in the UK biobank. And what they showed is that genes that associate with certain LV traits, and we'll focus on LVEF for right now, those uh, that are positively correlated with ejection fraction uh, 
uh, also associate with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and those that are negatively associated with ejection fraction are associated with dilated cardiomyopathy. And you can see that many of these LV traits uh, correlate in the opposite direction for hypertrophic versus dilated cardiomyopathy. So if we look at this figure here and just take one example, this particular SNP has a fairly strong uh, positive correlation with LV ejection fraction. It also has a very strong positive correlation with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but a strong negative correlation with dilated cardiomyopathy. And uh, similarly, if we look at this SNP over here, uh, fairly uh, negative correlation with EF, similarly strong negative correlation with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and a strong positive correlation with dilated cardiomyopathy. And so these investigators estimate that somewhere between 12 and 25 percent of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is due to polygenic inheritance. Now, um, this, uh, this last example I want to share with you, is, it's not um, sort of what we traditionally think of as, a, as polygenic, but it is, uh, I think, an important concept for us to understand. And so um, this, again, comes from our colleagues, Arthur Vilda and, and Mike Ackerman here. And this figure is actually not from that paper, but it, it demonstrates the hypothesis. And so uh, I'll go through this first. So uh, if you have a, a pathogenic variant in the coding region, uh, that, of course, occurs on one allele, and we all have uh, two copies of our genes, so we have two different alleles. Um, many of us also have regulatory variant uh, or variants in the regulatory region, so these don't actually affect the amino acid sequence, but they do affect expression of the allele. So uh, you might happen to have your pathogenic variant on an allele that is, uh, has variants in the regulatory region that actually suppress expression of that allele. And so in that case, you're going to have more uh, normal protein expressed and relatively less of the abnormal protein expressed. And that results in having a happy face here, right? Because you're uh, perhaps less likely to have a disease, or if you have a disease, it may be less severe. And the opposite situation is depicted here. You might happen to have your pathogenic mutation on an allele that uh, is overexpressed. And so you're going to have more of the mutant allele, less of the normal allele. And that leads to a sad face because you'll be more likely to have disease or perhaps a, a more severe form of the disease. And so this has actually been demonstrated in long QD type 1 by this paper here. And so uh, what's depicted in this figure, uh, these are QT intervals and the percentage of patients with symptoms in patients that all have uh, mutations in KCNQ1. But thanks to looking at the genetics from their parents, they were actually able to look at variations in the regulatory region and tell which allele this was on, if it was on the mutant allele or the normal allele. So let's start here in the middle of the figure where we have just the wild type in the regulatory region. And you can see that these individuals have a QTC that's sort of you know hovering right around 440, about 20% of them have symptoms. If you look here, these are individuals that have mutations here at these two uh, variants in the regulatory region. They, they happen to be in linkage disequilibrium, so they, they tend to travel together. If you're G here, then you're also G here. But these variants in the uh, regulatory region actually suppress expression of the allele that they're on. So since they happen to be on the normal allele, they suppress normal expression. So you're gonna have relatively more mutant allele and these individuals, as you see, actually have a longer QT interval and more symptoms than these individuals. If you look at the individuals that have those regulatory variants on the mutant allele, it's predicted that that would actually suppress mutant allele expression. Now you see a much shorter QT interval here. And now if we look at this additional variant that also suppresses regulation, you can see when that's on the normal allele, you have even more QT prolongation. And when that's on the uh, mutant allele, you have uh, shorter QT and, and, and fewer symptoms. So here we have variation in the regulatory region that actually causes a great degree of variable expressivity of the phenotype in long QT syndrome. And so uh, in summary, I think we need to rethink uh, how we've categorized our diseases, these so-called Monogenic diseases, first of all, may have polygenic inheritance in some cases, so perhaps up to 15% of long QT syndrome and perhaps even 30% of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy may be due to polygenic inheritance. And then I think many of our diseases, Brigada syndrome and even you know, with uh, variants in the regulatory region like long QT syndrome, we should think of our diseases as near monogenic, 
because of both rare and common genetic modifiers. So um, remember, when we look at a genetic report, we're looking at you know one variant among you know 6.4 billion amino acids in the human genome. So we don't want to give that one variant too much credit. And thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.